Hey guys, it's Mrs. Smith checking in with you. Um, I have some great news. Today is the first day of our read aloud and you have selected Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I know that it's in the reverse for you because of my camera angle and everything. But yeah, so we are beginning Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling. Scholastic did give us permission to read this out loud. Um, and the illustrations are by Mary Grandepi. So um, we will be reading 10 pages at a time each school day, so not on weekends. And who knows who might end up popping in and reading to us throughout our story. So today is pages one through ten. If you have it, you're welcome to open up and follow along too. Chapter one, The Boy Who Lived. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Private Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Mr. Dursley was the director of a firm called Grunnings, which made drills. He was beef, a big beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large mustache. Mrs. Dursley was thin and blonde and had nearly twice the usual amount of neck, which came in very useful as she spent so much of her time craning over garden fences, spying on the neighbors. The Dursleys had a small son called Dooley, and in their opinion, there was no finer boy anywhere. The Dursleys had everything they wanted, but they also had a secret. Their greatest fear was that somebody would discover it. They didn't think they could bear it if anyone found out about the Potters. Mrs. Potter, were, Mrs. Potter was Dursley's sister, Mrs. Dursley's sister. They hadn't met for several years. In fact, Mrs. Dursley pretended she didn't have a sister because her sister and her good-for-nothing husband were as un-Dursley as it was possible to be. The Dursleys shuddered to think what their neighbors would say if the Potters arrived in the street. The Dursleys knew the Potters had a small son too, but they had never seen him. This boy was another good reason for keeping the Potters away. They didn't want Dooley mixing with a child like that. When Mr. and Mrs. Dursley woke up on the gray, dull Tuesday, our story starts. There was nothing about the cloudy sky outside to suggest that strange and mysterious things would soon have be happening all over the country. Mr. Dursley hummed as he picked out his most boring tie for work. Mrs. Dursley gossiped away happily as she wrestled a screaming dooley into his high chair. None of them noticed a large, tawny owl flutter across the window. At half past eight, Mr. Dursley picked up his briefcase and checked Mrs. Dursley on the cheek and tried to kiss Dooley goodbye, but missed, because Dooley was now having a tantrum and throwing his cereal at the walls. Little pike, trotted Mr. Dursley as he left the house. He got into his car and backed out of number four's drive. It was on the corner of the street that he noticed the first sign of something peculiar, a cat reading a map. For a second, Mr. Dursley didn't realize what he had seen, and then he jerked his head around again. There was a tabby cat standing on the corner of Private Drive, but there wasn't a map in sight. What could he have been thinking of? It must have been a trick of the light. Mr. Dursley blinked and stared at a cat. It start, stared back. As Mr. Dursley drove around the corner and up the road, he watched the cat in his mirror. It was now reading the sign that said Private Drive. No looking at the sign. Cats couldn't read maps or signs. Mr. Dursley gave himself a little shake and put the cat out of his mind. As he drove down toward town, he thought of nothing except a large order of drills he was hoping to get that day. But on the edge of town, drills were driven out of his mind by something else. As he sat in the unusual, 
as he sat in the usual morning traffic jam, he couldn't help noticing that there seemed to be a lot of strangely dressed people about, people in cloaks. Mr. Dursley couldn't bear people who dressed in funny clothes. The get-ups you saw on young people. He supposed this was some stupid new fashion. He drummed his fingers on the steering wheel and his eyes fell on a huddle of these weirdos standing quite, quite close by. They were whispering excitedly together. Mr. Dursley was enraged to see that a couple of them weren't young at all. Why, that man looked to be older than he was and wearing an emerald green cloak, the nerve of him. But then it struck Mr. Dursley that this was probably some silly, silly stunt. These people were obviously collecting for something. Yes, yeah, that would be it. The traffic moved on, and a few minutes later, Mr. Dursley arrived in the grinning parking lot, his mind back on drills. Mr. Dursley always sat with his back to the window in his office on the ninth floor. If he hadn't, he might have found it harder to concentrate on drills that morning. He didn't see the owls swooping past in broad daylight. Oh, people down the street did. They pointed and gazed up open mouthed as owl after owl sped overhead. Most of them had never seen an owl even at nighttime. Mr. Dursley, however, had a perfectly normal owl-free morning. He yelled at five different people. He made several important telephone calls and shouted a bit more. He was in a very good mood until lunchtime, when he thought he'd stretch his legs and walk across the road to buy himself a bun for, from the bakery. He'd forgotten all about the people in cloaks until he passed a group of them next to the bakers. He eyed them angrily as he passed. He didn't know why, but they made him uneasy. He, this bunch were whispering excitedly too, and he couldn't see a single collecting pin. It was on his way back past them, clutching a large donut in his bag, that he caught a few words of what they were saying. The potters, that's right, that's what I heard. Yes, their son, Harry. Mr. Dursley stopped dead. Fear flooded him. He looked back at the whispers as if he wanted to say something to them, but thought better of it. He dashed back across the road, hurried up to his office, snapped at his secretary not to disturb him, seized his telephone, and almost finished dialing the number in his home when he changed his mind. Put the receiver back. He put the receiver back down and stroked his mustache, thinking, no, he was being stupid. Potter wasn't such an unusual name. He was sure there were lots of people called Potter who had a son called Harry. Come to think of it, he wasn't even sure his nephew was called Harry. He'd never seen the boy. It might have been Harvey or Harold. There is no point in worrying, Mrs. Dursley. She always got so upset at any mention of her sister. He didn't blame her. If he'd had a sister like that, but all the same, those people in cloaks. He found it a lot harder to concentrate on drills that afternoon when he left the building at five o'clock. He was still so worried that he walked straight into someone just outside the door. Sorry, he grunted as the tiny old man stumbled and almost fell. It was a few seconds before Mr. Dursley realized that the man was wearing a violet cloak. He didn't seem upset at all about being almost knocked over to the ground. On the contrary, his face split into a wide smile, and he said in a squeaky voice that made passerby stare, Don't be sorry, my dear sir, for there is nothing that could upset me today. Rejoice, for you know who it has gone at last. Even the muggles like yourself should be celebrating this happy, happy day. The old man hugged Mr. Dursley in the middle and walked off. Mr. Dursley stood rooted on the spot. He had been hugged by a complete stranger. He also thought he had been called a muggle, whatever that was. He was rattled. He hurried to his car and set off for home, hoping he was imagining things, which he had never hoped for because he didn't approve of imagination. As he pulled into the drive, of number four, the first thing he saw 
and it didn't improve his mood, was the tabby cat he'd spotted that morning. It was now sitting on his garden wall. He was sure it was the same one. It had the same markings around its eyes. Chew, Mr. Dursley said loudly. The cat didn't move. It just gave him a stern look. Was this normal cat behavior, Dursley wondered, trying to pull himself together. He let himself into the house. He was still determined not to mention anything to his wife. Mrs. Dursley had a nice, normal day. She told him over dinner all about Mrs. Next Door's problem with her daughter and how Dooley had learned a new word, won't. Mr. Dursley tried to act normally. When Dooley had been put to bed, he went into the living room in time to catch the last report on the evening news. And finally, bird watchers everywhere have reported that the nation's owls have been behaving very unusually today. Although owls normally hunt at night and are hard to be seen during the daylight, there have been hundreds of sightings of these birds flying every direction since sunrise. Experts are unable to explain why the owls have suddenly changed their sleeping pattern. The newscaster allowed himself to grin most mysterious. And now over to Jim McGuffin with the weather. Going to be any more showers of owls tonight, Jim? Well, Ted, the weatherman said, I don't know about that, but it's not only the owls that have been acting oddly today. Viewers as far as apart as Kent, Yorkshire, and Dundee have been phoning in to tell me that Instead of the rain I promised yesterday, they'd had a downpour of shooting stars. Perhaps people have been celebrating bonfire night early. It's not until next week, folks, but I can promise a wet night tonight. Mr. Dursley sat frozen in his armchair, shooting stars all over Britain, owls flying by in daylight, Mysterious people in cloaks all over the place, and a whisper, a whisper about the potters. Mrs. Dursley came into the living room carrying two cups of tea. It was no good. He'd have to say something to her. He cleared his throat nervously. Uh, Petunia, dear, you haven't heard from your sister lately, have you? As he has expected, Mrs. Dursley looked shocked and angry. After all, they normally pretended she didn't have a sister. No, she said sharply, why? Funny stuff on the news, Mr. Dursley mumbled. Owls shooting stars. There were a lot of funny looking people in town today. So, snapped Mrs. Dursley. Well, I just thought maybe it was something to do with, you know, her, her crowd. Mrs. Dursley slipped, Dursley slipped her, tipped her tea through her pursed lips. Mr. Dursley wondered whether he dared tell her he'd had heard the name Potter. He decided he didn't dare. Instead, he said, as casually as he could, um, their son, he'd be about Julie's age now, wouldn't he? I suppose so, Miss Mrs. Dursley said stiffly. What's his name again? Uh, Howard, isn't it? Harry, nasty common name if you ask me. Oh, yes. Mr. Dursley said, his heart sinking horribly. Yes, I, I quite agree. He didn't say another word on the subject as they went upstairs to bed. While Mrs. Dursley was in the bathroom, Mr. Dursley crept into the bedroom window and peered down to the front garden. The cat was still there. It was staring down private drive as though they were waiting for something. Was he imagining things? Could all of this have anything to do with the Potters? If it did, if it got out that they were related to the pair of, uh, well, he didn't think he could bear it. The Dursleys got into bed. Mrs. Dursley fell asleep quickly, but Mr. Dursley laid awake, turning it all over in his mind. His last comforting thought before he fell to sleep was that even if the Potters were involved, there was no reason for them to come near him and Mrs. Dursley. The Potters knew very well that he and Petunia thought 
what he and Petunia thought about them and their kid. He couldn't see how he and Petunia could get mixed up in anything that might be going on. He yawned and turned over. It couldn't affect them. How very wrong he was. Mr. Dursley might have been drifting into an uneasy sleep, but the cat on the wall outside was showing no signs of sleepiness. It was sitting as still as a statue, its eyes fixed unblinkingly on the far corner of Private Drive. It didn't so much as quiver when a car door slammed on the street next, or when the two owls swooped overhead. In fact, it was nearly midnight before the cat moved at all. A man appeared on the corner the cat had been watching, appeared so suddenly and silently. You'd have thought he'd just popped out of the ground. The cat's tail twitched and its eyes narrowed. Nothing like this man had ever been seen on private drive. He was tall, thin, and very old. Judging by the silver in his hair and beard, which were both long enough to tuck into his belt, he was wearing long robes, a purple cloak that swept to the ground, and high-heeled buckled boots. His blue eyes were light and bright and sparkling behind half-moon spectacles, and his nose was very long and crooked. Although it had been broken at least twice, this man's name was Lubus Dumbledore. Lubus Dumbledore didn't seem to realize that he had just arrived in a street where everything from his name to his boots was unwelcome. He was busy rummaging his, in his cloak, looking for something, but he did seem to realize he was being watched because he looked up suddenly at the cat, which was still staring at him from the other end of the street. For some reason, the sight of the cat seemed to amuse him. He chuckled and muttered, I should have known. He found what he was looking for inside his pocket. It seemed to be a silver cigarette lighter. He flicked it open and held it up in the air and clicked it. The nearest street lamp went out with a little pop. He clicked it again. The next lamp flickered into the darkness. Twelve times he clicked the putter outer, put outer until only light left on the whole street were two tiny thin pricks in the distance, which were the eyes of the cat watching him. If anyone looked out of their window now, even beady-eyed Mrs. Dursley, they wouldn't be able to see anything that was happening down on the pavement. Dumbledore slipped the foot outer back inside his cloak and set off down the street towards number four, where he sat down on the wall next to the cat. He didn't look at it, but after a moment, he spoke. Fancy seeing you here, Professor Mc goggle. He turned to smile at the tabby, but it had gone. Instead, he was smiling at a rather severe looking woman who was wearing square glasses, exactly the shape of the markings the cat had around its eyes. She too was wearing a cloak, an emerald one, her black hair was drawn into a tight bun. She looked distinctly ruffled. How did you know it was me? She asked. My dear professor, I've never seen a cat sit so stiffly. You'd be stiff if you had been sitting on a brick wall all day, said Professor McGonagall. All day? I never when you could have been celebrating, I must have passed a dozen feasts and parties on my way here. Professor McGonagall stiffly answered. Oh yes, everyone's celebrating all right, she said impatiently. You'd think they'd be a bit more careful, but no, even the Mongols have noticed something's going on. It was on their news. She jerked her head back at the Dursley's dark living room window. I heard it. Flocks of owls shooting stars. Well, they're not completely stupid. They think they were bound to be noticed something. Shooting stars down in Kent. I'll bet that was 
Alice Bigel. He had, he never had much sense. You can't blame them, said Dumbledore gently. We've had precious little to celebrate for 11 years. I know that, said Professor McDungle irritably, but that's no reason to lose our heads. People are being downright careless out on the streets in broad daylight, not even dressed in mogul clothes, swamping rumors. She threw a sharp sideways glance at Dumbledore here as though hoping he was going to tell her something, but he didn't, so she went on. A fine thing it would be if on the very day you know who seems to have disappeared at last, the Mungles found out about us all. I suppose he really has gone, Dumbledore. It certainly seems so, said Dumbledore. We have much to be thankful for. Would you care for a lemon drop? A what? A lemon drop. They're a kind of muggle sweet I'm rather fond of. And that is the end of chapter 10. Just want to quick thank Scholastic for allowing us to read to you guys and log on tomorrow to hear the next 10 pages. Bye!